Hello, everyone. It is great to see people starting to trickle in um, to our webinar today. My name is Sahad Baba. I'm the executive director of Just Vision. I'm joined by three brilliant colleagues um, who I will be introducing in just a moment, but I'm going to give everyone a chance to get settled in here and give a few people who might be trickling in still a moment um, to catch up with us. For those who have joined us, I would love to see um, who's with us in this room today and what that spread is ge geographically. Um, so if you're willing to share where you're calling in from, that would be really phenomenal. We had an overwhelming response to this conversation today, so I anticipate that we're going to have a great spread. The UK, California, we have Brooklyn, New York, Seattle, France, we have Minnesota in the house, mm -hmm. Berlin, Germany, show up, Massachusetts, London, Morocco, welcome Morocco. South Africa, Cape Town, Edinburgh. Wonderful. This is so exciting to see so many people joining us for what I believe is an incredibly important and timely conversation. All right. So in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today's conversation is on the new Israeli far-right government and the resistance to it. My name is, again, Sahad Baba, and I am the proud executive director of Just Vision. We're a team of journalists, of filmmakers, and human rights advocates, and we have a laser-sharp focus on filling a media gap on Israel-Palestine. We do this through journalism, storytelling, and strategic audience engagement. Our team is delighted to co-sponsor this gathering today with 972 Magazine, an independent online nonprofit magazine run by a group of Palestinian and Israeli journalists who are committed to equity, justice, and freedom of information. I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleagues, Diana Butu, a legal expert, analyst, and policy advisor to Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, Orly Noy, a Mizrahi activist, board chair at the leading Israeli human rights organization, B'Tselem, and she is here today in her capacity as deputy editor at Local Call, the Hebrew language news site Just Vision co-publishes together with 972 Advancement of Citizen Journalism. And no surprise, we are also joined by Hagai Matar, my partner in crime or all good trouble made, um, longtime journalist, activist, and CEO of 972 Advancement of Citizen Journalism. We're lucky to have the three of them with us for what will be a full 90-minute conversation. We'll spend about 40 minutes or so in a moderated conversation um, with me. I have a few questions to help ground us. And, and then we're really going to turn this over to all of you for a conversation that's guided by your curiosities. Um, just a um, word on housekeeping. Um, we are all very familiar with Zoom at this point, but for any of you who may need a reminder, um, the Q&A box at the very bottom of your screen, um, it has two little talking text boxes. You're going to go ahead and use that to drop your questions into the Q&A so that I can field those while we um, move on in our conversation. Today, our conversation is both, again, timely and I believe necessary and urgent. It's also one that's unfolding and evolving in real time. Part of the reason the four of us wanted to have this webinar is to take some time to unpack what's happening, to help equip you all with information about what's happening on the ground and hopefully together to provide some insight into how to make sense of it. But most importantly, this conversation, as I mentioned, is an urgent one. There are real lives being impacted by what's happening in Israel, Palestine, Palestinian lives, that are being swept away by the moment. Um, meanwhile, there is near silence in the international community um, at a time when we know that pressure on is the Israeli government is necessary in order to enact change. And so in, in addition to making sense, to providing information, we hope that this conversation is a call to action 
and is one that inspires you to think about what you can do to get more deeply involved and how you can ensure that others are aware of what's happening on the ground and paying attention. And there's a lot that's happening. Last year, Prime Minister Netanyahu and a coalition of far-right parties gripped the election win in Israel. In recent weeks, we've seen exactly what their far-right agenda means for communities on the ground, as it's, they take aim widely on the judiciary, on journalists, on culture and art shapers, education, and certainly, certainly on communities, Palestinian communities first and foremost, LGBT communities, and far beyond. On one hand, there are some things about this government that is new, largely in how blatantly unhinged and audacious they have been. But on the other hand, and importantly, this government is acting consistently with an Israeli regime that has long privileged certain communities over others. The impact on communities on the ground has been both severe and blunt. The Israeli military has been engaged in an unrelenting collective punishment campaign against Palestinian communities, resulting in the killing of dozens of Palestinians since the start of the year. Living in a tinderbox, we've seen lone Palestinians responding in some cases using weapons against Israelis that have led to casualties. But most importantly, as the Israeli government, as this regime continues to enact apartheid policies, there has been no sense of accountability on the ground. Um, meanwhile, you do see Israeli communities organizing mass protests in opposition to the regime. And there's a lot here to unpack, to understand, and to really put into context. So I'm excited about now turning this over to Hagai, Orly, and Diana to help us put it into context. And I want to start off with you, Hagai. As we dive in, um, can you catch us up on how we got here and set the scene on this new government? Um, what led to the elections? What does this government look like? And what is their agenda? Sure. So there's really a lot to unpack here, uh, and, and I'll try to be succinct. Um, and thank you also for, for having me for this partnership and welcome everyone uh, joining us. Um, basically, I think that the most important context of all the recent developments uh, and all developments in Israel-Palestine is the regime of apartheid uh, that's been here with us for decades and has gradually, especially over the past decade or so, um, been very efficient in moving the Israeli society further and further to the right. Uh, this has been a huge victory for Netanyahu and the right in general, um, where the issue of occupation, treatment of Palestinians, um, has gradually been removed from the agenda uh, in, in, to a certain degree because everyone is kind of convening around uh, accepting the way that the regime operates in the suppression of Palestinians. Um, and so just today, one small example, uh, the Knesset approved a bill proposed by the government to take away citizenship or residency only from Palestinians convicted of terrorists, not of Jews convicted of terrorists, just of Palestinians. Um, and that was supported by all opposition parties, all Jewish Zionist opposition parties. So, so that just gives a sense of how even in these very um, um, chaotic times, there are still things that unite um, the, the kind of coalition and opposition, and that's the support for, for this regime. Uh, we've also seen this in the previous government, which has was this unique coalition of um, religious, liberal, right-wing, left-wing parties, uh, so-called the government of change, that uh, actually, while presented as an opposition, as a, as a change from the Netanyahu years, uh, was responsible for more Palestinian deaths and more Israeli deaths and more home demolitions and administrative detentions than any year in over a decade before. Um, so that all kind of leads us to, to the reality of the latest elections in November and the most right-wing government ever to be formed in Israeli history, which is now in power. Um, this government is made up of several different strands of the Israeli right, including um, mostly uh, very religious parties, um, uh, fundamentalists, um, homophobes, and, and others, uh, some overtly fascist parties. Um, and 
what they're trying to do, as you were saying before, Suha, they're moving towards uh, several very dramatic shifts that some of them are continuations of what we've seen before, especially towards Palestinians, deepening annexation uh, and, and con construction of settlements, uh, demolitions and so on of, of Palestinian homes and so on, but also uh, attacking the uh, education system, the media, uh, the field of culture, um, giving more space to religion in civilians' lives within Israel, and um, a deportation of asylum seekers. So we have all these fields of, of attacks that this government is planning. Uh, the, the pivotal point that is now kind of the center of media attention and public debate is changing basically the system of regime around the judicial system. Um, and, and it's important to understand in this context that Israel has only one house of parliament and that house is governed by the government. So there's, there's no separation of uh, authorities there. The government and the, the parliament are basically one. And the only check and balance against the, the this power of the government is the courts. The courts have traditionally supported apartheid, have been very supportive of that, but have put in place some checks and balances on the government uh, in terms of human rights uh, in certain conditions. What we're seeing now is that the government is basically trying to defang the judiciary, basically cancel the ability of the courts to supervise power, uh, leading to uh, an attempt to delegitimize outlaw all Palestinian parties in the Knesset, which will guarantee an eternal rule of the right and which will allow them to carry out all the other reforms they're planning uh, without the supervision of the court. So that is what's happening right now in general. Uh, that's what is causing the opposition to go into uh, really unprecedented uh, steps of protest, but I'll, we'll leave that for later. Thanks so much, Hagai. Um, and Orly and Diana, is there anything that you want to add before we move on? Okay, great. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and, and jump in and dive in with you, Diana. Um, there's a lot of talk about how to respond to the new far-right government, but the most deeply impacted by its policies are often left out of that conversation. Um, can you share a little bit more about what this new government means for Palestinians in Israel-Palestine and how communities are responding? Um, first, I wanted to thank you, Saad, for, for hosting this. And I also wanted to thank uh, Orly and Hagai for um, appearing on the, the same platform. It's, it's lovely to see you and to be speaking with you and sharing with you. So I thank you for putting this together. In terms of what this government is, uh, is doing, look, as, as Haggai already mentioned, each and every Israeli government from, from 1948 until now has always put Palestinians in their crosshairs, literally. And whether that is, <clears throat> through the means by which um, of actually killing Palestinians, targeting Palestinian land, targeting Palestinian homes, making life so miserable that people leave, imprisoning Palestinians. This has been the common, um, the common strand since 1948 to the current day. The difference between this current government and previous governments is that this government has been given a green light by the world. And why do I say that they've been given a green light? Because this government came out very clearly. They didn't. Ha they don't have um, different policies that, for example, maybe other political parties might have. Like they can hide behind economic platforms, or they can hide behind other uh, issues that they want to address. This government has has put all of their energy into one issue, or two actually, two issues, and only two issues. One is saving Netanyahu which is why we're seeing all the changes to the judiciary. But number two, and which is more important, is targeting Palestinians and targeting any form of dissent, any form of resistance to Zionism and what have you. And so what they've been doing is that they, they've made this clear. They made it clear on the eve that the government was formed and the way that they announced um, what the platform of the government was going to be, which is the exclu that it was exclusively Jewish, exclusive self-determination for the Jewish people, um, that all of all of the quote, land of Israel, including 
they can't even get themselves to say the West Bank, um, including as they put it, Judea and Samaria, you name it. And uh, and then we heard immediately thereafter the demolition of Mosaf Faryatta. We heard uh, that they were going to, we've heard Ben Gvir talk about um, demolishing Palestinian homes in East Jerusalem. We've talked it, we've heard them talk about the reinstatement of, of destruction of Palestinian homes inside 48. Just yesterday, four 70 year old homes were destroyed inside Akya, uh, Palestinian homes. Um, we then saw yet another, uh, this law that Haggai mentioned about revoking citizenship. We've seen them try to ban the, the Palestinian flag. I mean, they've made it clear what their goal is. They've made it clear, they've made it blatant. So much so that Smotrich, the, the, the Minister of Finance, who's also now in charge of um, settlement construction, is a, has has indicated that he's a fascist homophobe. Ben Gvir himself was a person who called uh, Baruch Goldstein his hero. He dressed up as him for Purim. And so this isn't a government that the, the mask is off. You, they can't hide. And yet, even though they're not hiding, the world response has been pathetic. And beyond pathetic, it's been uh, it's effectively giving Israel a green light. We're still hearing about the visa free entry into the United States. They're still talking about it. The U.S. government talked about how they're going to judge the government based on its actions, not based on its individuals. And yet we've seen what's happened just uh, yesterday when there was the announcement of the of let's be clear nine new settlements not the legalization of a previously as the way that they the, the u.s came out with this world word salad that meant nothing to anybody and effectively what has happened is that time and again um these governments have been given the green light to do whatever it is that they want to do we saw this in 2009 when avigdor lieberman was appointed foreign minister this is a man who called for the chopping off of heads of palestinians and who wanted to have a loyalty test um the at first we saw you know the usual hand wringing and within a year europe had upgraded ties with with israel this is the same thing that we're seeing today so you ask the question, what is it that people should be doing? Look, I so I don't know how to say this, but I know that this is going to come to an end. I know it. I know in my heart of hearts that this system of oppression will one day see an end. And just in the same way that we saw that in the aftermath of, uh, in the fall of, um, South African apartheid, you can't find anybody who was pro-apartheid today, right? Even though there were plenty. We're going to be in that same position where people say, oh yeah, I was on the front line pushing for Palestinian rights. I know that that's going to happen in the future. I know that that's going to be the end scenario. And the problem is, is that, I, that we need to be working now to make that happen. And this is why it's so important to be redoubling the efforts when it comes to pushing for boycotts, redoubling the efforts when it comes to sanctions, making sure that Israel's isolated and not coddled because the more that Israel gets coddled, as we saw in 2009, this has been the result, is that the further more to the right it becomes. And, and so it's really imperative upon us to be continuing to push and demand that this government be held to account, but not just held to account, that in the year 2023, the Palestinians shouldn't have to be living under Israel's boot any longer. So that's where I'm hoping that things will go. And I think that we have the skills, we have the power. The world's like governments may not be on our side, but people are. And that's where I'm hoping that we will see some change. Thank you so much, Diana. And just incredible, um, given the number of years that you've been doing this work to be able to hold that um, deep belief and that deep conviction um, and also know that that requires our action today is just, um, I think you couldn't have said it better. So with that, Orly, I'm going to turn to you on the note of change and how change happens. We've been seeing a lot um, about um, the Israeli protest movement that's emerged in response to the current government. Um, 
And there's been a lot of questions about, you know, some very excited folks out there who are like, look, this is the Israeli, you know, society um, waking up after years of dormancy. Um, and in other cases, I think some who have been more critical um, and uh, cautious about what is taking place on the ground. Can you share with me um, what are the demands of those who are protesting currently? Um, and what are the protests shortcomings and potential for change? I'd love to hear about this. I know you've been writing about this and thinking about it a lot. Um, yeah, well, uh, first, uh, thank you so much for uh, Suhat for hosting this. And it's really such a privilege to speak along, alongside uh, Diana and Hagai. Um, yeah, we have been seeing in the past uh, few weeks uh, since the establishment of uh, this government, um some of the most massive demonstrations that we've known we've seen since uh years uh, in israel and i think that generally speaking those demonstrations this protest shows uh two main things the first is that there is a big mass of the israeli public that really is uh, it does not feel comfortable with having a government with clear fascist elements in it, we should remind that uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir is the only member of the Knesset that was actually convicted with supporting a terrorist uh, organization. Yes, this man is today uh, responsible for so-called our security. He was convicted of supporting terrorism. And uh, they feel that this government um, is threatening uh, their liberal values and can actually um, threaten uh, their some of their most fundamental uh, freedoms <clears throat> and rights. But those demonstrations also show that the same mass of people see look at some way at this government. Um, as a deviation or uh, 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 as a stepping uh, away from the tracks uh, of the so-called Jewish and democratic uh, state and not as an in inevitable result of a regime that is based on Jewish supremacy. And what they really want, in a way, is to turn back the clock to a situation in which apartheid regime can be continued on, uh, under the pretense of uh, democracy without international scrutiny and without their own rights being uh, uh, threatened. Um, and this you can see uh, in the messages uh, of the, of the uh, protest, in the speakers, the main speakers of the protest, and in, in the practices. Uh, of the protest. Among the speakers, we can mention some of the main yeah, figures that uh, speak in those demonstrations are former uh, uh, chiefs of uh, the staff in the army and chief of police, uh, people like Bogi Alon, uh, former Prime Minister Ehud Barak, uh, Yair Golan, uh, Roni El Sheikh, uh, all uh, who came from um, uh, the, the, the uh, Israeli military and uh, police forces, people who devoted most of their adult life uh, to oppressing uh, Palestinians. And all of a sudden, on the, under the pretense of these protests, they became uh, the, the heroes uh, and the saviors of democracy. You can also see it in the people who are not among the speakers, and those are, of course, Palestinians. I mean, uh, very few Palestinian speakers have been uh, invited, uh, certainly to the main demonstration, which is taking place weekly uh, in Tel Aviv. Among the participants, uh, 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 the groups that participate uh, uh, as groups in this protest, you can find ex-soldiers for democracy, um, all sorts of uh, military and paramilitary groups for democracy. And you can even find settlers for democracy now that are also protesting uh, against, you know, uh, uh, the division uh, inside the, the the Jewish people, of course, and let us unite and let us, you know, n n not go to civil war and whatnot. 
and by the way, I think it's no accident that the uh, uh, the more mainstream avenue of uh, the settlers are very worried because they know that uh, this government can uh, attract uh, international attention to what they have been doing under the radar or without any criticism, subset, substantial criticism for years. So. Uh, they are also now protesting uh, for democracy, and you can also see it in the messages of uh, these protests. Um, as Chagai mentioned, uh, 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 defending the Supreme Court is one of uh, the main messages, and this is the same Supreme Court, which also, as Chagai mentioned, uh, legitimized every war crime that Israel committed and commits uh, against Palestinians. And they say it very clearly. It's not even an analysis or interpretation of, of the messages. The, one of the main messages of um, this uh, protest is he, uh, support or, or protect the Supreme Court because they are, 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 they are the shield that protects our soldiers from the ICC. So they know that this is one of the main roles of the Israeli uh, Supreme uh, Court. And you can see it in the practices of, of uh, the, the protest. Um, as I mentioned, almost no Palestinian uh, speakers, and of course, almost no Palestinian participants as well. Millions, really, literally, to see of Israeli flags, it's almost, there's something very, almost violent, certainly very demonstrative about the massive uh, numbers uh, of uh, Israeli flags um, and keeping away the Palestinian flags and people who brought Palestinian uh, flags uh, were not received that well in that uh, protest. Um, I will just very shortly mention that we it's not that extraordinary. I mean, we've seen mass protests um, in Israel in the last decade. We can speak, we can um, mention the uh, what was called the social protest in 2011 <clears throat> against the high uh, cost of living. And uh, uh, of course, the Balfour demonstrations, uh, which are more people more connected, affiliated with the current uh, protest, which was successful successful in a way that it really did bring down the, the previous Netanyahu government. But there is also a, a, a I think one big different difference. I think that what brought people out to the streets to protest against Netanyahu back then was uh, the issue of corruption. And, 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 and I think that even, you know, even if they didn't speak about everything that we would want them to speak about, there was something healthy about masses of people going out and protesting against the, 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 the simple notion that corruption is not something that we, we want in our leadership. Here it's different because, as I said, it's the the um, desire to bring back uh, the the clock uh, uh, without any accountability to the reasons that brought us here. Here, um, and therefore, um, I'm not that optimistic about uh, uh, their outcome. Thank you, Orly, for the candor. Um... In, in everything that you just shared. And I, I wanna turn this to Diana um, to hear a little bit more, uh, and, and Orly, you spoke a bit about the response of Palestinian communities to the protests or kind of actually lack of participation in those uh, in the protest movement. Um, Diana, can you unpack that? Share a little bit more with us around how Palestinian communities in 48 in particular are responding to the protest movement um, and, um, and, and 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 take us a step deeper in terms of you know where uh, the Palestinian community is is fitting into the kind of conversation within Israeli society. I think you know in our conversations, you've spoken quite powerfully to um, the the dynamic that's emerged over a long period of time. Of, on one hand. Um, uh, excluding Palestinians from the discourse and from the practice of um, 
of democracy and from uh, freedom of expression and yada yada. And at the same time, the expectation that Palestinian communities ally themselves in these moments. Um, can you can you share more about that with us? And you're on mute. Yes, I forgot I was on mute. Yes, <laughs> I was very excited to begin and I forgot I was on mute. Um, thank you for the question. It's a really good one. Where do I begin? So th let me begin by saying that um, for years and years and years and years, the Palestinian members of Knesset, or let's say the anti-Zionist parties that are in the Knesset, because there are a few of them who are Jewish as well, um, have been pushing and, and saying to the world that Israel is heading towards fascism. They've been saying this for years. Um, they pointed to everything from the changes that Lieberman had proposed to the election law to make it much more difficult for Palestinian parties to actually make it, to pass the threshold, to make it into the Knesset, to uh, the Jewish nation state law, to the citizenship law, which prevents Palestinians from actually, from Palestinians who hold Israeli citizenship from, from living together with their spouses who happen to be from the West Bank com or completely from the Gaza Strip, from the West Bank or from Arab countries. They mentioned it when it came to the law that has that allows for Israel to destroy Palestinian homes, including inside 48. I mean, they've been, they've been, they've been the, the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, screaming and shouting that this boulder of fascism is headed our way. And, and, and as much as they have screamed and shouted and screamed and shouted, the only support that they have gotten has been from the Palestinian community and from a small group of, of Israeli leftists or anti-Zionists uh, who, who get this, who understand that, that, again, that we are in the crosshairs. And so here we are now um, with a fascist government by their own description, they're a fascist government, racist fascist. And, and now this protest movement is taking place. Um, and there's an expectation that somehow Palestinians are going to just naturally join with this protest movement. But again, that's the, that's the thinking of somebody who, who lives under Jewish privilege, who lives in a supremacist society, where they think my issue must be your issue. And you must participate because you are, you know, also affected. And what Orly's mentioning about the way in which these protests are happening is absolutely correct. There is something very violent about them. When you see a sea of Israeli flags, the flag that is the very symbol of my dispossession, ethnic cleansing, uh, occupation, dis de you know, demolishing houses, killing people, imprisonment, that is not that's not welcoming at all. It's quite the opposite, it's alienating. And what the uh, protesters are calling for is somehow a magical reverse to November, first days of November, early, you know, last days of October. And if we just turn back the clock, then we're all going to be good. And what they don't realize is, A, Palestinians are viewing this with a big eye roll, um, just to be clear, we're not participating. And, but B, and most importantly, we're not going to be part of a protest movement that just seeks to reinstate the same level of Jewish supremacy, ignore our oppression, and, uh, and pretend as though life is good and fun and wonderful. It's not. This is a Supreme Court. Um, if you just look at the Supreme Court, because that's the issue that most people are focused on. This is a Supreme Court that has justified uh, the Israel's demolition of Palestinian houses, destruction of Palestinian houses. This is a Supreme Court that says it's okay to use Palestinian bodies as bargaining chips. This is a Supreme Court that has uh, allowed for these citizenship laws to pass. This is the same Supreme Court that said that it's okay for communities to discriminate against uh, Palestinians in housing because God forbid, you know, they might have to live next to a Palestinian. Um, this is this at every instance when faced with the idea of democracy versus Jewish supremacy, this is, Supreme Court has always chosen Jewish supremacy. And so the idea that I'm going to be to be protesting to have a return to Jewish supremacy, no, thank you. And this is the part that people are not understanding. Now, 
it's not just that. There's always been, um, th there have been protests like this in the past. And one of the things that I, that we heard in the in the protests in, in 20, I think it was 2011, Orly, that you mentioned the, the social protests over the high costs of living, Stav Shafir, for example, was one of them, was that it was always like, oh yeah, don't worry. This is the issue of the moment. We'll get to the Palestinian issue. This is always what they say. We'll get to you. Don't you worry. Just stand alongside us. You will get to you. We'll get to you. The issue is they will never get to us. They've had 75 years to address Palestinians. And for 75 years, they have not. And they will not because the state is founded on Jewish supremacy. And I will not be part of a protest movement that seeks to restore the level of Jewish supremacy that existed in, uh, in end of October, beginning of November. Um, all of this, unless there's a movement that's out there that's really looking at challenging the system, challenging the status quo, and not challenging this government because of the small little tinkering that is doing, it's, this is not something that, that uh, Palestinians are going to be joining in. And, and I think it's um, I think it's repugnant for people to be asking us to to join it, given what this court, what this country, what this government has has done to us for all of these years. Diana, thank you so much for that. And um, as we're starting to shift gears, I want to start taking questions from the audience. Um, some folks have dropped in questions and also comments in the Q&A box. <laughs> So um, I'm going to invite folks to, um, if you have a question, please do type it into the Q&A box. Again, that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we're going to start taking those questions. Um, I do think that there's, you know, there's a, there's a question that's offered that I want to pose to this group where it comes back to the protest movement. And, and it's a question about whether there's a there's growing kind of sentiment amongst Israelis themselves about including um, an analysis around government repression of Palestinians in the protests themselves. Um, I'd love to hear from, from you all where that's happening, even if it might be in small pockets. Um, and also, um, what what is gonna what is required to actually I think Orly you use the phrase hold up a mirror you know or kind of be self aware of what is actually taking place here what is required for that to happen what are the elements that we need in place so I I want to jump in like um, with a slightly different position uh, while I agree fully with literally everything that Orly and Dana just said about the protest movement, and I can say things, you know, additional things that are terrible about it. Um, I do also want to offer at least two um, more positive perspectives on, on what is happening. Um, and, and one is that I do think that it is essential and it is in the interest of people like ourselves um, to, to be a part of that movement. Um, and that, yes, while there has been apartheid in all the things we've been talking about all this time, um, an actual full-blown authoritarian fascist regime can be worse. Things can get worse than they are now. Uh, the, the, what the government is planning for Palestinians, for civil rights organizations, for the left, for the media, it's all much, much worse than what we have seen so far. Um, and if we all become even more persecuted than we have been, I don't think that will contribute to the struggle that we've been leading. So, so first of all, because of that, I think there's a point in allying with the protest movement. Um, the second thing is that protest movements are a messy animal. It's not, um, yes, I mean, you have your center stage in Tel Aviv, you have, you know, with speakers uh, like Bugia, Alon and Ronin Shech, you know, talking in front of 130,000 people. But within that, you have different strands and you have different people coming out for different reasons and going through different processes as they get politicized. We were talking, early mentioned the 2011 protests for social justice, the 2020 protests uh, against the Netanyahu government and, and corruption. In both of these movements, while neither of them was centered around apartheid in any way, both of these movements had uh, groups of activists organizing within them, trying to radicalize the movement, trying to kind of hold that mirror up to other protesters, not from the outside, not kind of sitting home and saying, I'm not a part of this because, 
you know, so and so, but actually being on the streets, taking part in what's going on, you know, getting arrested if you need to, as part of the movement, but also leading a struggle within the struggle and saying, we can't say that this is a struggle for democracy when we're basically trying to sustain apartheid. Um, and that's been happening with this movement as well. So you do have, with every single protest throughout the country, you have um, kind of radical blocks within them, people carrying Palestinian flags, carrying signs against apartheid, carrying signs for, for actual real um, equality and democracy. And that um, event, that, 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 that uh, uh, situation where you have uh, people trying to politicize uh, and galvanize other protesters on the street mean something. Sometimes they're responded, they, they, they get the response of people trying to beat them up and chase them out of the demonstration. Other times people just look at them at dismay and like, how is this connected? Why exactly are we talking about Palestinians right now? And other times people are like, yes, actually, and I've, I've been there, I've been in those blocks several weeks in a row um, and actually see literally hundreds and thousands of conversations taking place every week where people would come up, ask, uh, come up and say, like, why have you brought a Palestinian flag to this demonstration? And the person holding the flag would actually explain how this is relevant. And people would be like, yes, actually there is apartheid here. I didn't think about it that way. Or like, yes, actually the occupation and the way Israel treats Palestinians, that is the core of, of everything that's happening right now. I didn't think of it that way. That's, that's meaningful. Um, the, the, the people in this block have been kind of bringing posters and kind of placards and, and stickers and they've run out every single week. They've been giving out hundreds and thousands of these stickers and placards to people who did not plan to talk about the occupation and apartheid in the demonstration. They came because of the main call that is very conservative. But in the, the, the protest, during the protest, they became politicized. And the same happened in 2011 and 2020, where we saw many people who came for one reason, but after that became now we know them as some of the most prominent activists in solidarity with Palestinians. Uh, so that uh, a moment of, of radicalization is something that I think we should be striving for and is another reason to play an active role uh, in this movement. Thanks, Hagai. And I see Orly ready to jump <laughs> in. Great. No, I, I I actually agree with Hagai. I mean, I um I know the anti-apartheid and occupation block. There are many of them are good friends of ours, and I really admire um, their uh, ability to continue going on to those demonstrations, holding those signs against apartheid and against the uh, occupation, having those conversations. I don't dismiss it at all. Maybe, you know, it's also a question of personal temper. For me, really physically, it's it's um, the, when I see those masses of Israeli flags and the, the, the and the Bogi Alon, the war criminal, Bogi Alon on the stage, it's not, um, it's not a place that I can bring myself physically uh, to, to participate. But I also want to say, that uh, those mass demonstrations are certainly not the only way to object um, the, the, the uh, political reality. We all have been engaged uh, in political activism long before those protests, and we have so many different platforms and ways and um, uh, 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 things that we are engaged in uh, with, and, and uh, we, it's not that if you do not go to those demonstrations, then you sit passively and and just wait for something. And we none of us is passive. We we do activism by journalism, by our journalist work, work by the NGO. I don't know. Personally, for me, it's B'Tselem. It's the political parties that we are sometimes uh, involved with. Uh, uh, it's the demonstrations in the with alongside the uh, with the Palestinian. Palestinian residents that we go to, if it's in Sheikh Jarrah or in Silwan or in other places in the West Bank. So it's not participating in those uh, uh, demonstrations or sit uh, uh, passively at home. We are not passive. 
I just don't feel the, the, the capacity, I'm not resilient enough to participate in those specific demonstrations. Thank you. You know, I often think about the role that each of us plays in our various um, capacities and given where our ability to influence changes. And I think, Orly, you're speaking to the many ways that people can participate and show up um, to create change. And one of the things that I think often think about, you know, that has been a, a long time call from Palestinian communities is for Israelis to create change within their own societies, that that has to be something that there are folks um, paying attention to in all of the different ways. Um, I also, you know, oftentimes at Just Vision, we think about the role that the international community, you know, on one hand, we need there to be a kind of committed group of um, Jewish Israelis who are activating and dissenting with the government and being ready to put their bodies and lives on the line and use their voices to speak out. Um, there needs to be a supported um, Palestinian grassroots effort. And by supported, I mean, and I'm seeing commentary in our chat box of folks talking about the need to fund Palestinian resistance movements and fund Palestinian freedom movements. Um, the need to really support and, and uh, those efforts. And there needs to be international pressure that not only international pressure, but there needs to be an, um, at the very least, we need to see, stop seeing actors, namely the United States, from shielding Israel and its behaviors. You know, just morning, just this morning, I woke up to an article about um, the Biden administration um, stopping the nomination of one of their appointments because of the fact, it's a human rights appointment, because of the fact that um, the individual had called Israel an apartheid state. That couldn't be more obvious in terms of the level of protection, not just the failure to act, but the level of protection that governments like the United States are offering to this regime. Um, and so I just, you know, and this speaks to several of the questions I think we're seeing in the in the um, chat box, including the role of international pressure. Um, I want to come back to that question. Diana lifted it in her um, comments earlier, but I want to take a moment on that. What does that mean? What does international pressure look like? Um, what for a lot of the folks on this call who are calling in internationally, um, what can people do? in their um, capacities. You know, I think about the fact that movements are built from a wide range of people who have different influence and different levels of, of, of kind of reach. What can people do right now to be thinking about and engaging on this in a way that is constructive and helpful? Or maybe put another way, what can people stop doing? Um. I'll just offer a quick thought. Uh, I, I I didn't have the chance to go through all the countries from which uh, uh, people are, are joining us tonight, but I'm pr pretty certain that it would be safe to say that if not 100%, that the 99.9% .9 of those countries are uh, uh, actively uh, collaborating uh, with Israel in deepening and promoting apartheid and occupation in so many ways. And so the, the one thing that I would suggest is uh, dig into those connections of your government, of your local uh, 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 industries, um, factories, whatever, um uh, with uh, with Israel and see the threats that lead to uh, Palestinian territories, to the uh, uh, industries of uh, so-called security or surveillance or whatever. There is, the international community is so deeply uh, involved, in maintaining the, the, the system of oppression and violence against Palestinians. And I'm pretty sure that no matter where you're from, your country is involved in that. Private sector in your country is involved in that. There is a, 
uh, uh, there there are resources such as who profits from the occupation places that you can go and find out who are which are the companies from your country that are involved in the, uh, maintaining the the occupation and the oppression that are profiting from it and promote uh, campaigns in your own um, countries that th that sort of uh, local public opinion pressure can be sometimes very very helpful and certainly it's the very it's the moral thing to do so that's one way that you can be active thank you orly diana yeah if i can just add you know I don't know how many people heard about the heard the announcement about the mayor of Barcelona and the call to cut off ties with Israel. That doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens when there is activism and it happens when there is political support given to those individuals who take those positions. And uh, and so the when when you think back to where movements have happened where change has happened I don't expect that change is ever going to happen on a state level. I really don't. I mean, we, we're, we, none of us should be expecting that there's going to be a state that's going to fly in and, and make a, a pronouncement against, uh, against Israel, you know, the, the occupation shall, uh, must end. But there is a lot of work. There already is a lot of work that's happening, which, which is really, it's, it's heartening. I mean, it makes you, it, it, it's the only thing that, that makes you survive in this place. Um, but just to double down on those efforts to make sure that Israel is not treated as a normal state. That's what Israel has always wanted. It's always wanted to be treated as a normal country, um, which is why it, in all of these years they've been seeking Palestinian recognition of, of, of the state of Israel. That's why they they want recognition not only of the state but as a Jewish state. They want us to be able to acquiesce to our own ethnic cleansing. Um, this is why the, they invest so much money in trying to fight any of these boycott laws. This is why they spend so much money trying to malign people who are affiliated with the boycott movement. This is why they spend spend so much money trying to shut down or make life difficult for NGOs, including NGOs that are operating here, because they want to be viewed as normal. And what the boycott movement does is it shines a spotlight on them and says, you are not normal because you're not normal. And because you're not normal, you're not going to be treated as normal and so on. And so I think that, you know, just to add to what Orly was saying, it's, it's, there's a lot of resources that are out there. And the more that we can make sure that Israel's not treated as normal, and not just on the state level, but even on an, a day-to-day -day, everyday level, there are things that we as individuals that can do um, when it comes to the boycott movement, there's a lot of support that can be given to people like the mayor of Barcelona who makes these statements or to uh, other people who are taking these uh, decisions. And that's where I think for the time being, our effort has to be. The other thing that we can do is we can support Palestinians. And one of the things that has been, again, really disheartening is seeing the, the finger wagging at Palestinians and telling Palestinians how we should be behaving, particularly in this space and in this place and in this time. And I think if we want to really support Palestinians, we should be supporting Palestinians in every form. In the way that uh, in the way that we protest, and it, whether we choose to attend or not choose to attend, and the, our focus must be on uplifting Palestinians rather than wagging a finger at them and telling them "Thou shalt not." Um, so I think the combination of making sure that Israel is is ostracized, not treated as normal, as well as um, as making sure that we we are actually supporting. Palestinians. I think those are the two things that I would encourage people to do. Thank you so much, Diana. And I think, you know, Orly and Diana both spoke to um, the importance of international grassroots efforts that really do seek to um, put pressure on the Israeli government, whether it's Barcelona or boycotts or divestment actions. Um, Diana also alluded to the ways in which the Israeli government has gone great lengths to shield themselves from these efforts. Um, including the passage of numerous laws in places like the United States 
um, and beyond um, attempts in, in, in several European countries as well um, to um, make to punish those who seek to boycott the state of Israel, um, including the companies that perpetuate the occupation and apartheid, um, Israeli companies, US companies, European country, companies, you name it. Um, and so the for those who are interested in learning more about that, um, my colleagues are going to drop information about Boycott, which is a film that, doc, that Just Vision um, produced around the anti-boycott laws that are moving. Um, my hope is that film is actually going to be available um, on streaming platforms Amazon, Google Play, Vimeo, On Demand, et cetera, starting March 1. Um, so it will be available widely globally. Um, I highly encourage folks who are cu curious about what they can do, either getting involved in these kinds of campaigns or fighting back against these laws, which are actually meant to inhibit the ability for grassroots movements to gain traction, which is one of the areas where momentum has been building internationally and one of the key pressure points for change. Um, so as we go on, I, I want to, um, we have a, a question about, um, about kind of real true solidarity or joint anti-apartheid, anti-colonialist movements that Diana, you had mentioned earlier in this conversation. Um, and the question is, is there any serious organizing to create the real joint anti-apartheid, anti-colonialist movement that you've mentioned? Um, and I'd love for, in particular, Diana and Orly, both of you have been involved and in various ways with different efforts in Israel-Palestine, um, and specifically, I think, have been um, both observing and kind of very closely um, uh, involved in, in efforts like those, like Ballad, for example. Um, and there were some really interesting developments around the role of, of Ballad. Um, in the last elections. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? What did that look like? Um, and what what can we take away from what we're seeing in that in that space? Uh, you're referring uh, specifically to Balad. Yeah. Um, the, uh, Balad, the, the, the Palestinian um, uh, Democratic National um, uh, Party that was, uh, uh, which I am involved with, uh, I'm an activist in that party, uh, which was part of the uh, United Joint List and for reasons which we will not go into right now, found itself um, running by itself in the uh, last uh, elections and ended up not passing the threshold and not entering the the uh, Knesset, the parliament. That turned out to be a very teaching and a very interesting moment for Balad, because while everybody, I mean, it, it was a surreal almost situation in which um, the, it, it, it came very, very close. I mean, it was very, very close to passing the, the threshold. And then the next morning, a very peculiar situation uh, was uh, created in which, you know, the the, the center left and uh, the uh, basically everybody that is not in the Netanyahu camp was feeling um, defeated and uh, went with their you know head sort of uh, with their heads um, down. Um, but had celebrated from the very next day. It was a celebration because it was a demonstration of power and a demonstration. And a, a, um, it was a celebration because it was um, what what Balad celebrated was the ability to say that we do not have to play uh, uh, the Zionist game in order to demonstrate power. And it was a demonstration of power. And since then, outside the Knesset, Ballad has been the most active than I remember since years. They are reviving the student uh, cells in the universities. They are reopening the branches that were closed for some time in um, uh, different cities and towns. They are holding gatherings. And the, all of a sudden, there is this new uh, vibe or the, this new feeling that 
we can be an independent democratic voice that does not give in to the Zionist uh, game, not from the, we are not part of the left and we are not part of the right. We are a, 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 an independent uh, uh, Palestinian national democratic choice. And actually it is now the only democratic choice that speaks clearly about the uh, a state for all its citizens, which is like the most fundamental uh, thing for functioning democracy. Only in Israel, it's considered to be something very radical uh, and unheard of. So I think the role of Balad today, more than any any time before, to hold the alternative to fascism, to, which is inevitable. And if we, even if the, the, those demonstrations will be a, able to turn back the clock, we will end up in the same place again because it's an inevitable turn of the of a supremacist regime there is no other way and Balad today is holding the only alternative and this is what i meant by saying that we do not have to participate in those demonstrations in order to resist uh, uh, and this is exactly what Balad is doing today thank you orly um I'm shifting gears a little bit. There's some questions around Palestinian leadership in particular, and I'm wondering if we can take a moment to unpack what's happening with the PA Hamas um, and where Palestinian communities are in relationship to those entities. Um, and the follow-up question, just kind of um, following on from just the update around what's going on there is um, kind of a curiosity that's kind of coming up in the Q&A around what it would take for Palestinian intellectuals, grassroots leaders, community leaders to pose a unified kind of vision for the future um, in light of what is happening um, with Palestinian political leadership. I'm assuming that's directed at me. <laughs> I, yeah, <it> is. <laughs> I, I think so. <laughs> Um, all right, where where's the government? Oh, it, it's it, you know it's like it's a big stretch to call this a government. Why do I say it's a big stretch to call it a government? Because the Palestinian Authority is really only operating on such a small space of territory in such a limited way for such a limited group of Palestinians. Remember, two thirds of Palestinians are outside the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And even within the West Bank, the PA really only has control, if you can even call it that, over a very small portion of land. Um, and in Gaza is you know, the size of a dot, it's really tiny. That's not, the issue isn't size. Um, the issue here is that this is a government that was was established under the Oslo agreements. The Oslo agreements themselves were only supposed to be in place for five years. So maximum, this was a government that was supposed to last from 1994 to 1999, May to May, 1994 to May, 1999. We're now in 2023, way past the, the expiry date of the Palestinian Authority. And the reason that that's important is because the what the authority was supposed to do was the, the thinking, the logic behind it was we're in a process of negotiations and because we're in a process of negotiations, we need to make Israel feel safe. The only way that Israel can be made to be feel safe, Tom Friedman used to write about this all the time in his racist way, is to get um, the Arabs to, to, to sniff out the other Arabs. This is what he wrote at one point in time. And, and so what they were looking for in 94 to 99, was to have a government that was going to be involved in security collaboration. In other words, do Israel's dirty work for it, because that's what security collaboration means. It means arresting Palestinians. It means throwing them in jail. It means torturing them. Some cases means killing them. And that's what, um, what Israel sought with security collaboration, what some people call security coordination. Now, the the negotiations and like collapsed ages and ages and ages and ages ago. And yet the only thing that remains of this Palestinian authority 
is the security collaboration. That's it. That's all that remains. And the only way that it maintains its legitimacy, it's not legitimate in the eyes of Palestinians. And I'll explain why in a second. But it does maintain legitimacy in the eyes of Israel and the international community because it continues to believe in security cooperation collaboration. That's all that it does. So given that it's, it's viewed as relevant in their eyes, they continue to prop it up. Why is it irrelevant in the eyes of Palestinians? We haven't had elections. There hasn't been a referendum about what, what it is that we want. Uh, they're not. This isn't a government that is supporting us. This isn't a government that is protecting us. We have nobody protecting us, zero. We have settlers after us, soldiers after us, an entire state after us, and the PA goes in for to help instead of actually defending us, protecting us, supporting us. So the, the state of the PA today is, in the eyes of Palestinians, irrelevant. It doesn't exist, but it's in the eyes of the international community that it is relevant. And that's why it continues to be propped up. That's why we continue seeing that the, the further the Palestinian Authority stays long, and particularly Mahmoud Abbas stays in power, I've written about this, the more that he stays in power, the more authoritarian the, the Palestinian Authority becomes. And it's no coincidence because that's the only his only claim to to legitimacy is not through his through the people he represents, but through through the donors and through and through Israel's eyes. And that's it. Is there a movement to have intellectuals united? We don't need intellectuals united. Every Palestinian, if you can find me one that doesn't believe that we deserve freedom, I'll give you whatever you want. We all are united in our belief that we need to be free. That's it. And there, we don't need to have like an initiative or another, another initiative or talk about, you know, two or one state. I mean, that's all just sort of intellectual uh, fantasy at this point. We are united when it comes to what it is that we want and we want to be liberated. That's it. We want our freedom. There's no disagreement between any of the factions. There's not a single faction that says, yes, we deserve to live under Israeli military rule. Yes, we deserve to be dispossessed. It doesn't exist. So there is already that. Uh, it taking shape. My fear is that because the PA has gone on for such a long period of time, and, and I don't know how much longer it's going to last because uh, Abu Mazen is in his 80s and his health isn't good, um, but because this has gone on for such a long time, the only thing that people envision now is a replacement to Abu Mazen. And I don't want to just replace Abu Mazen. I want to do away with this system. And that's where I think that our energy needs to be focused on. And that's why I was saying people need to, you know, support us in our efforts to, um, to, to, to do what it is that we need to do to, to liberate ourselves. Thank you so much, Diana. I want to, I want to take a moment to just, um, to, to hear a little bit about how all three of you think about, you know, each of you are, is doing some incredible work um, in your respective areas um, to create change. Um, actually, a lot of the work that all three of you have been dedicating your lives to has been around um, shifting narratives, amplifying perspectives, um, and, and, um, and really, you know, in some cases, I think of the fact that, um, there have been several instances where I've seen your work. I remember as, as, a as a teenager looking at certain areas of work, Diana in particular in the 1990s, when you were calling it, you were saying, look, Oslo is a disaster, right? And it was the, pre the premonition I think was, was really, um, clear. I want to, I want to take a minute to ask you to each reflect on your experiences to date in terms of what you've been dedicating your, your life's work to. Um, one, so that people understand and hear kind of the, the various areas of work that you've really kind of enriched, which I've, I think is such a powerful inspiration. Um, and also, you know, to, if you can share a little bit about why you do that work, because I think that kind of the, the change and the intention um, behind the work each of you do is tells us something about and this audience something about where to be paying attention right now. So I want to just take a moment for those who didn't read everyone's bios here, for who didn't get the chance to really ask themselves, um, you know, who are these amazing people that I'm going to be listening to this afternoon, evening, morning, um, to to actually unpack some of that because I think you know when when I'm 
um, engaging audiences. When I'm thinking about the folks that I talk to, a lot of folks um, need to um, be educated, need to engage in deeper conversations around this. And then there's a lot of folks who are like, how do I make a difference? I'm with you and I need to make a difference. Um, I want to make a difference. And so I just want to take that moment to, to reflect as we start to wrap up um, this conversation. And any one of you can jump in. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead no, no, no. Go ahead. Um. Yeah, I think. I mean, for me, my my activism has mostly been around um, solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. Um, it, it that has looked like um, protests, mostly in the West Bank, also within Israel. Um, in in just participating in kind of the popular resistance against apartheid in all its forums, uh, also conscientious objection, uh, my own uh, uh, 20 or so years ago when I refused the draft um, and supported the conscientious objectors since. Um, but also, and especially after I came out of prison and kind of inspired by people I met in prison, um, becoming involved in struggles for social justice within Israeli society. So uh, that was in part around um, housing struggles, uh, but also and mainly into this day, organized labor. Um, so those are kind of the fields that I've been involved in. And um, I think all of those different fields to me kind of culminate in the work that I'm doing and have been doing for more than a decade now in independent journalism, um, trying to kind of push back against mainstream narratives on all these different issues like that, that I think the left here has to to really take a stand and push back against how both the economy and society are represented in mainstream media and uh, public opinion and uh, the Palestinian issue and, and the connection between them as well. So those are kind of my fields of um, activism. Thank you, Haggai. Orly, I'm just going to call on you. Yeah, sure. Um, so obviously, I mean, the main field of acti activism has been um, um, solidarity with Palestinians and uh, uh, resisting the apartheid and, and um, occupation in different capacities. But also one of the main things that I'm um, an activist in is uh, the Mizrahi struggle. The Mizrahim, for those who are unfamiliar with the term, are the um, uh, Jews who immigrated to Israel from Arab and Muslim countries, such as myself. I grew up, I was born and I grew up in Iran, and we immigrated to Israel after the Iranian Revolution in 79. And I'm also a translator of Farsi literature into Hebrew, and for me, it's a complete completely political, part of my political activism. And I think that the combination of these two, um, and speaking of shifting narratives, it really made me realize that the root of the oppression is one, because the colonial nature of uh, the Israeli regime is based on despising the geopolitical environment in which it exists. And it's very violent and deadly uh, against Palestinians who are its uh, first and foremost uh, target, but it also dictates the Israeli regime's uh, attitude towards the Mizrahim, towards the Jews uh, that are native to this geopolitical uh, uh, territory. And, I, and realizing for, uh, that we are, it's not in a way, it's not even being a pro-Palestinian, um, um, you know, um, activist. It's, it's, it's our own interest. And I think that um, there are so many Jewish communities that are trapped in this trap of supremacism, but in other ways are paying the price for 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 that uh, supremacist um, system, and um, the the for me, I mean, first 
it's also a Jewish moral obligation. I mean, it's being done in my name and therefore I have a responsibility, a moral responsibility to do something about it. But I think that, you know, speaking of, of optimist or positive vision, the ability to, we, the, us, the Mizrahi communities once lived in this territory as natives, not as colonialists. And I really, I think that, that this is such a, an inspiring vision to act towards, to uh, break down the walls of this uh, colonial racist regime so that uh, people will be free and we will be able to go back to be just natives here uh, uh, as opposed to uh, colonialists in, in, in this villa in the jungle that Eud Barak once uh, described Israel as. Thank you, Orly. And Diana? Uh, I'll be quick. Um, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> and I spent uh, a few years working as a lawyer for the Palestine Liberation Organization and switched gears a little bit. And I'm an analyst and writer, um, active, very active within my community, which is Palestinians who hold Israeli citizenship, and also active um, in my second home, which is um, in the West Bank, in in Ramallah and uh, everything that's going on over there. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, this conversation um, has been wide and I think in areas deep. And I always know that there isn't enough time to go as deep as we could on any one particular topic. Um, there's been a number of questions that we've been able to touch on throughout this conversation from the audience, and there's a lot more that we haven't been able to touch on. Um, and I'm going to take moderator's privilege here as we start wrapping up the conversation um, to kind of regroup um, and kind of bring this conversation home um, as we're, we're wrapping up. You know, one of the things that I often think about, this is an incredibly dark time on Israel-Palestine. Um, and I think at the same time, for those of us who have um, been working on this for years, in some cases, decades, for those of us who grew up in it, who have families who are part and parcel of it, um, we also know um, that, and I think Diana's sentiment around the fact that we know that change will come um, is a driving force in how um, we continue to do this work every day, um, and that this work ultimately takes a village. It takes um, people like those of you who are joining us today um, to take the knowledge and the information and the stories and perspectives that you heard today and put them to work. Um, that means sharing them. Um, I encourage you all to follow Diana, Hagai, and Orly. Um, they are prolific writers and thinkers who are constantly um, generating um, and in the business of both knowledge production and advocacy and activism. Um, I encourage you to share this webinar. We will be making it available online if you wish to. Um, and I hope that um, those who've been following the chat box, um, you've been able to appreciate some of the resources that our colleagues have been dropping in the chat box. We'll also make sure to follow up with everyone so that um, you have links, Twitter handles, face. I don't even know if Twitter is going to be around in a couple weeks, but um, the handles that you need to follow folks, the links that you need to follow folks, and, and the resources that we circulated. Um, so as we're closing out, I do just want to actually turn this over to um, the amazing three of you, um, Diana, Hagai, and Orly. Um, can you please share with us, you know, when we got together this morning, this afternoon, this evening, um, we talked about the fact that this webinar has to be a conversation, not simply as an intellectual exercise, not simply as um, a conversation for people to walk away from and feel like they listened in and that was what their participation looks like in this. Can you share a little bit with us reflecting on that, uh, on the urgency of this moment, on 
that's the folks that we have with us. And thank you to everyone for giving us 90 minutes of your day to be part of this and to hear us and to, to tune in. Um, what, what do you want people to walk away with today? I'm just going to call on people. I'm going to have, um, Orly, why don't you kick us off? Then we'll go to Hagai and we'll close with Diana. Yeah, thank you, Suad. I mean, there are so many things that I would want the audience to take away. Certainly the urgency, really, it's not an intellectual exercise. Uh, look up the name Harun El Aram uh, and see what is the meaning of, of the reality that we are discussing. And just if, if, and going away and, and being active, you will most probably at some point be accused of anti-Semitism. Please do not get into that uh, trap. Do not make that accusation, that horrible, horrible, immoral accusation to stop you from doing whatever it is that you need to, to, to do. Israel has been using the anti-Semitism card um, so carelessly uh, in order to shut down and shut up everybody that speaks about solidarity with Palestinians. And not only that solidarity with Palestinians is the most moral thing to do, the, 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 the accusations themselves are in a way anti-Semite because anti-Semitism is about excluding the Jewish people from um, uh, human norms. And by trying to shut up any objection and to get uh, Israel exempt from the, the uh, uh, or, or to get away with murder, literally with murder, murder uh, uh, Israel is basically asking the international community exactly that, exclude us from the norms that you would apply anywhere else. This is anti-Semitism. Don't give in into those accusations. Do what you have to do. There is a lot of work to be done. Thank you, Orly. Hagai, can I invite you in here? Um, yes, to, to me, I think the most important thing, uh, connecting to what we were saying before about the protest movement, is just reminding people the wider context of this government. Um, just as we are doing here with demonstrators on the ground, with people who are now kind of waking up and saying, wait a second, we want democracy and talking about like talking to them about, we haven't had democracy here ever. Uh, so I think that is really important abroad as well. We see this way too often where people would say, oh, now Netanyahu is in power. So, you know, Israel is going to stop being a democracy or now Netanyahu is in power. And you see actually people like the Biden regime suddenly releasing statements about settlement construction um, that they didn't release with the previous government. Uh, because when it's not Netanyahu, then suddenly it's kind of people like us. It's kind of, you know, you see people like Lapid, if you're abroad there, oh, now the liberals are in power and that's great. Um, I think there's that uh, just misconception. It's really, really important to push back against um, and help people understand that it, we, we don't just need to get rid of Netanyahu and get back to the previous status quo, uh, both because it's immoral and because it's unsustainable. We got to where we are because of that alleged status quo, which was actually a sh constant shift to the right. Um, so, so just pushing back against that narrative to me is, is really, really important while also resisting what this government is doing. Thank you, Hagai and Diana. Wow, what do I say after both of them? Uh, <laughs> I, th I think the, the one thing that I would like people to take away is that for Palestinians, this has never been a democracy, ever not since 1948 to the current day. And between the years of 1948 to 1966, 
Israel imposed uh, military rule on Palestinians, including the like Palestinians who hold Israeli citizenship. My 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 parents, for example, um, and and so there was only a brief period of time between sixty six and June of sixty seven where there wasn't military rule, but there's always been a state of emergency since nineteen forty eight. Since 66, Palestinians have been living, since 67, excuse me, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza have been living under Israeli military occupation. So when I see that there's uh, these discussions about Israel's soul, Israel's democracy, et cetera, Israel's soul is about denying the freedom of Palestinians to live. It's just that simple. And unless we want to get to a place where it's not about that, then we can't keep putting our heads into the sand and asking for a rewind back to October of 2022, when this is definitely much deeper than, than all of this. And I think that this is the time where we have to keep our, our eyes and keep talking about what, what supremacist societies look like. What does Jewish supremacy look like? What does this government and every other government do to Palestinians? And how is it as a Palestinian living in the con with the constant fear that this government is, or every government is going to target you. We are, we live through a system of death by a thousand cuts. Every day we wake up knowing that tomorrow is worse than today. And, and we wake up to bad news. We, we go to bed with bad news. And if anything, I, I do want people to realize that this isn't just about throwing your hands up in the air and 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 you know walking away. We do have the ability, we do have the tools to end this. And it's imperative on all of us to do that. And that's by pushing for the boycotts, pushing for sanctions to be on Israel, pushing for, um, for Palestinian freedom, pushing for, for there not to be recognition, not just of this government, but other governments. There are things that can be done. And again, you know, I'm gonna leave by saying, I, I know that this is gonna end. I do know. In my heart of hearts, I know that this is going to end. And the question is whether people are going to hang their heads in shame and say we should have done more, or whether they're going to be on the right side of history and be working now. And that's why you have the last word, Diana. Thank you so much. I promise that we would get us out of here on time um, with about 30 seconds to spare. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you again. Orly, Haggai, and Diana for leading us through both a very difficult, but I think enriching and important conversation today. I hope those who joined us have a lovely um, evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you might be, have the chance to process this conversation and think about how to put this to work. We will be following up with you in short order to make sure you have this webinar to share with others and you have resources to continue to follow this work. Um, this is a story that continues to unfold. How it unfolds is up to us. And that is something that we have known through and through at Just Vision. I think that is a shared sentiment with all of those of us on this panel today. Um, and we are so grateful that we have a community, I should say, of over 200 people that joined us today that I believe share that um, vision and that perspective and so onward. Thank you again. Have a good night, a good afternoon, and a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.